The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Yo, Philly, how you doing? Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. I'm Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. New York Yankees Hall of Fame catcher Yogi Berra once observed that baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. Many of us are still not sure what he meant by that, but clearly the mental approach to the game is every bit as important, if not more important, than the physical ability to perform. For pitchers, this is especially true. Back in the 1990s, after a high school English teacher by the name of Harvey Dorfman accepted a job as a mental skills coach for the Oakland A's, Major League Baseball became sold on the mental skills concept. Not only did those A's win a world championship, but Dorfman went on to become a full-time consultant to MLB and wrote several books on the mental approach to the game. Our guest on this uh, podcast is Bob Tewksbury, who picked up where Dorfman left off. The mental skills coach for the San Francisco Giants and the former mental skills coach for the Boston Red Sox 2013 World Championship team, Tewksbury earned his master's degree in sports psychology and counseling from Boston University. Prior to that, he won 110 games over a 13-year career with the Yankees, Chicago Cubs, St. Louis Cardinals, Texas Rangers, San Diego Padres, and Minnesota Twins, and was named to the National League's 1992 All-Star team. Bob is also the author of a recent book titled 90% Mental, an all-star player turned mental skills coach reveals the hidden game of baseball, which was published by the Capo Press. Welcome to the podcast, Bob. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, thanks for the great lead-in and uh, introduction to that. That was great. Thank you. Listen, let, let's begin with the obvious question. Why is pitching 90% mental as the title of your book contends? Hmm. Well, I think that um, not only pitching, but I think everything that we do is 90% mental. You know, I think that, um, you know, amateur golf, regardless of what your handicap is, is mental. I think that dealing with delays in airports and traffic that's out of your control is mental. I think that um, response to somebody in your office that maybe uh, you have conflicting interests or disagreements is mental um so it's just not exclusive to baseball i just happen to use that as the the vehicle to send the message of you know the mental aspects of performance are important and um my backdrop is from the pitcher's mound Mm -hmm. back in the 1970s when i was growing up and i was an athlete the catch word was particularly you know, on the mound in a game, focus, focus, focus. But we never had any techniques uh, or were really given any techniques to focus. So, so much of what you seem to be suggesting in your book uh, are techniques uh, to get that focus, which allows you to succeed physically in your performances. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, well, I think focus is um, kind of multidimensional, if you will. Concentration, focus, um, being in the moment, you know, uh, mindfulness is a big uh, uh, movement right now in a lot of different ways, and that's been around for thousands of years, you know, the meditation and mindfulness. But it's coming back to our day-to-day activities, and it's coming out and as far as, the benefits of that with athletes. So I think the key is to, ultimately, the the key is to be in the moment, a non-judgmental moment to focus on the task. Um, So what gets in the way of that are distractions, and the distractions are external distractions with the crowd, the significance of the game, the conditions of the field, um, you know, various things that, in large part are out of your control and the internal distractions which come from maybe unrealistic expectations the desire to be perfect uh 
you know, negative self-talk, confidence, lack of confidence, um, trying to make everyone happy. Um, so these are all things that get in the way of performance, and the ideal performance state is to be void of those internal distractions and external distractions and to focus on the task at hand, whatever that task is, if it's throwing a pitch, if it's hitting a putt, if it's being in the line at the supermarket and, you know, the register's broken and you can't go anywhere, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of um, the ability to be present and, as they say, be where your feet are um, is the goal. And it's really difficult because our mind wanders and um, we get distracted by various things. But I think, you know, an athlete will tell you that their best performances, they didn't think about anything. They were just free, and it was all an automatic pilot. Um, and that's the state that everyone works toward to try to get in to perform, uh, but it's difficult, and it's a, it's a constant work in progress. Now, in your book, you point out that the idea of a sports psychologist working with a baseball team dates back to 1938, when the Chicago Cubs owner, Philip Wrigley, hired Coleman Griffith to work with his players. Mm -hmm. But that initiative wasn't so successful because manager Charlie Grimm openly mocked Griffith as a head shrinker and ordered his players not to cooperate with him. So it really wasn't, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it really wasn't until the late 1980s when Dorfman was hired by the A's as a mental skills coach that the idea was resurrected. What, why did it take such a long period of time? Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that the um, lack of education, the lack of understanding, you know, it was, you know, remember baseball back then was no weightlifting, pitchers, you know, there were no pitch counts, there was no arm exercises, there was, you know, there was really old school stuff. And so, to come in and talk about any feelings or thoughts related to performance was certainly not something that was going to uh, carry any carry any weight. I think that you know over time, um, you know Ken Revisa, the late great Ken Revisa, and Harvey, you know Harvey got his start. They both get their start around the late '80s. I think Ken was with the the uh, Angels, and there's a great chapter in the book, as you mentioned, about the struggles of starting in baseball. And uh, Charlie Mayer, who's now who's still with the Indians, goes back to about that time. But I think that, you know, strength and conditioning didn't come into baseball until the early 80s. Um, I think Nolan Ryan was ahead of his time when it came to that. He had his own program that showed that people – players could lift weights, especially pitchers, and I think that um, the, um, so so it was, I remember in 86, this is the first time I was really introduced to strength and conditioning, and that was the old Nautilus machines, and we had a strength coach and with the Yankees, and not every team had that, uh, had that resource, and I think that's when there slowly has been a tick up in you know, the attention to mental skills and sports psychology, um, and it's grown now to where, you know, it's part of the CBA where teams need to hire somebody that can do mental skills or sports psychology work or be a resource for the players. So that's a good thing. The players want it. Um, but it's like any, you know, anything with, with mental health or anything associated with mental you know, the stigma is associated with it, especially in a macho sport like baseball or any sport for that matter. But, you know, I mean, you know, there's a there's a rise in the crisis of, of mental health issues. And I just spoke at the uh, Greater Manchester uh, Mental Health Center here in, in New Hampshire, and I did a presentation on mental health and professional athletes and what the risk factors are and what the uh, challenges are for players. And during my research, since 2009, there's been 14 professional athletes that have committed suicide. Um, and in large part, they've suffered alone. They didn't have a resource. They didn't want to tell anybody. 
Um, and so you think about that's a very deep layer as it comes to mental health, but mental skills and sports psychology is still is the first layer, and there's still a lot of players that don't want to talk about it. So it's really taking a lot of time to break down these barriers, educate people what you do, uh, what it is, what you do, what you don't do, and how it works. And um, thankfully, it's it's growing, but there's still a long way to go. Now, you mentioned Nolan Ryan as kind of a transitory figure. In Philadelphia, we were very familiar with Steve yes, Carlton. Carlton. Steve, yeah. Yeah. Carlton hated to lift weights. He hated to run, but he worked with a strength coach by the name of Gus Huffling, and oh, Huffling yeah. gave him these real, at the time, uh, strange strengthening techniques, like slowly submerging his hand into a barrel full of rice. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlton also engaged in yoga and martial arts training. And the, the Phillies even created a mood room for him where it was just a dark room with an easy chair and there was like a plasma screen TV and he just went into his own zone. And if I'd ever seen any pitcher be able to focus, it was Carlton. And you begin to wonder, was that why a guy like him and Nolan Ryan were able to go nine innings and pitch complete games? <laughs> Well, that's part of the reason. You know, the other reason was because that was the old school philosophy. Um, you know, there were a lot of pitchers in that era that threw a lot of complete games and pitched a boatload of innings. But I think you're on to something with, with Gus because he was kind of the, you know, the shoulder program. And I remember, you know, the Phillies were well known for being ahead of the curve when it came to strength and conditioning. And Carlton, of course, was – so focused on the mound, he had cotton in his ears, and, you know, he, he just was so focused that, um, you know, it definitely helped his performance. Plus, he was, you know, 6'5", 230, and threw 95 miles an hour, probably. So, with a wicked slider, those things help, too. But, uh, mm -hmm. but now, you know. You, you admit that during your major league career, you did not possess the fastball of a Steve Carlton or a Nolan Ryan. Instead, you had to rely on control, but you were still a very effective pitcher, according to slugger Fred McGriff, who called you a comfortable offer. I love that. McGriff, according to McGriff, you didn't throw very hard, so he wasn't intimidated by you. But then at the end of the game, McGriff looked up and he was 0 for 4 against you and pissed off about it. <laughs> so... Yep. How did your, you know, how did you succeed in that sense? I mean, were you your own mental skills coach when you were? Well, I mean, yeah, I think essentially, you know, I um, I took a lot of pride in my mental approach. I, you know, I kept my own scouting report. You know, we didn't have uh, the in-depth reporting that they have now, but I kept my own journal. I kept my own notes on hitters i developed my own scouting report and you know i got to know what i could throw to fred mcgriff or andy van slyke or you know uh gary sheffield based on past experiences based on situations so i had to use all of that you know information to to compete and then you know i just i know that even today you know uh a well-located fastball doesn't always get hit out of the park. As a matter of fact, doesn't always lead to hits. But pitchers are kind of into the, you know, the trick mode. Very rarely. I mean, you saw it last night. Ryan Madsen threw three fastballs by J.D. Martinez, but um, it's not. And I think the reason he was able to do that is because I don't think he thought he was going to get three straight fastballs. I think he was sitting off speed at some point and. So a fastball, regardless of the speed, located down and away, is still the best pitch in baseball. The problem is that, you know, pitchers don't often, uh, some pitchers don't often repeat that delivery into that location, um, and they don't trust throwing it back-to-back. -back. I think that's fastball, curveball, fastball, changeup, changeup, curveball. You know, they they don't often go back-to-back, -back, but... Again, I pitched 20 years ago, 
uh, a lot's changed, and that was just my philosophy. It's maybe not necessarily what people do now. Now, when you when you entered the mental skills uh, coaching profession, Harvey Dorfman told you something interesting. He said that being a pitcher would be both a blessing and a curse as a mental skills coach. What what did he mean by that? Yeah, not only as a pitcher, but as a professional player. Um, and what he meant by that was that I have all the information of being a player. I've been in the locker room. I've won games. I've lost games. Lost games. Uh, I've been in play with Hall of Famers. You know, I've, there's nothing that's going to happen in that environment that's going to surprise me. But based on all those years of playing, that oftentimes is the the Rolodex, if you will, or the memory bank that you that I or athletes fall back onto when they're doing mental skills work. When you should be thinking of a mental skills position first. So, um, so say it would be easy for me to talk to another pitcher and have him say how he felt on the mound, and I could revert to being a you know a colleague uh, as a pitcher sharing my stories. When if I looked at it as being a mental skills coach, the pers- the perspective would be a little different. And he was right. He was right about that because it, it's one of the things I struggle with is to not revert to the player knowledge base but to my applied science base as a mental skills coach. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to key in on just three of the many techniques that you use because – um, as I mentioned before, um, my pitchers are very familiar with your book. I make sure they're familiar with the book, and, and I've used these skills pretty successfully in coaching my pitchers. And, and those three techniques I just want to key in on are breathing, visualization, and positive anchor phrases. Mm-hmm. Bob, can you briefly describe each one of these techniques and explain why they're so effective? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, the, the, the imagery of the visualization is was uh, probably my most powerful skill that happened the night before or the day of games where I would just put myself in a place mentally of, of seeing myself execute pitches or getting certain people out or pitching in certain situations. It was like a dress rehearsal for the game. And, it you know, the research talks about how beneficial – that is, and that's something that I read as a kid, you know, that with the Olympic athletes and especially because this wasn't a skill that was going on for many sports teams, but the Olympic athletes were using it in individual sports like golf and tennis. Um, So, you know, imagery visualization, it's just seeing yourself be successful, but it's also a concentration exercise and it takes focus and uh, I had a lot of games that I ended up successfully, I hope I should say, just the way I had anticipated, you know, um, because of the work that I put in mentally. So that's the pregame prep. And then end game, you know, I think negative thoughts come and go. And, you know, don't walk this guy, don't hang this pitch. I hope I don't give up a run. You know, what's the coach thinking? You know, uh, don't walk the leadoff guy. The coach is going to be mad. Whatever thoughts run through a pitcher's head, and you have to let them go. Or, you know, all the mindfulness stuff now talks about just, you know, having the thought and letting it go. Don't try to change it. Don't try to latch onto it and figure it out. Just let it go. And what I did was I deleted the thought by swiping the rubber, hitting my leg with my glove, shaking my head, you know, to shake it out. And and then I would go back behind the mound. I'd take a deep breath to just kind of start over again. And then the positive anchors are kind of metaphorically, it's it's like if you're out, of, out in the lake and you have no anchor on, uh, down in, the, in, in the, the water and the storm comes, the boat's going to go wherever the storm takes it. Mm-hmm. But if you have an anchor down, you can weather the storm. 
And performance is the same way. If you don't have a foundation of which to to keep yourself grounded when the storm comes, you're gonna your performance is gonna go wherever it takes you, and oftentimes that's not good. So the anchor statements for me replaced the negative thought and and kept me directed on the focus. You know, it could be uh, you know just like on the side or fastball down and away for a strike or curveball down for a ball or fastball up and in. So. I would replace those negative thoughts with a statement focused on the task, and that became my anchor statement. One of the reasons I find this book so valuable is that you're just not talking to professional baseball players. Um, You know, those of us who are coaching high school kids can get an awful lot out out of this this book. In fact, uh, it's because (laughs) – as you've identified, the classic teenage boy is obsessed, self-absorbed, and often impatient. Mm. And, you know, you talk about, I guess you identified, what, you had an older brother who was that way? Was, was that? No, I have a younger brother. Yeah. A younger brother. Mm. Um, how do you discipline a 90-mile-an-hour thrower to become a mentally disciplined control pitcher because we got a lot of talented 90 mile an hour throwers Mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to harness that and help them become a disciplined control pitcher is that even possible to do with a team well it is but it's the work you know i mean i you know my control didn't happen overnight my control happened when I was in high school. I'd go up to the schoolyard and throw a ball into a strike zone or try to hit a certain brick. Um, I was always throwing things at targets, and that never stopped. And so uh, my my control got refined, but it's, it was also a mindset. You know, I think, I think um, you know, so the, the couple of things come to mind. Number one, you know, throw the. I don't care what the velocity is. Does a player have pitcher have repeatable delivery, and does he know his delivery and can make pitch to pitch corrections? The answer to that probably is no for a high school guy. So that's where imagery can come in. You can work on your mechanics. It's just not seeing people, getting people out. It's perfecting your your own mechanics in your mind's eye. Um, and then it's practice. You know, it's not focused on the results but it's rolling up your sleeves getting dirty and practicing the the little things of command and repeating your delivery and then it's a mindset of i don't have to try to trick these guys or throw the ball by him that i want to pitch to contact so you know i think pending the players uh you know um, attributes physically and mentally you know can he absorb this is he does he retain it uh, do, do his mechanics allow for that? I think it is possible, but it's certainly a, it's not a one-size-fits-all one type of thing. Now, your book talks about the process of professionalization mm. uh, and, and how mental skills are extremely important, particularly in the first year of the minor leagues because of the different challenges and the level of competition a former amateur pitcher is is facing uh and and because at the amateur level most of these guys knew nothing but success in terms of victories and strikeouts and now he's forced to measure his success in a very different way it might be something as simple as locating a particular pitch on a consistent basis or throwing a ground ball instead of a deep fly ball what's the best advice that you could give to a, a rookie league or a class A pitcher who's trying to make that transition? Well, you know, <laughs> that there, this is a process of development, and along the way, the checklist is going to include failing um, multiple times, uh, maybe seeing people that you play with move up, players move down, being injured, you know, not pitching as much as you'd hope. Um, you know, not not having the results that you were used to having. Um, you know, that's all part of the process. You know, I, I 
I had two surgeries. I get traded. I get released. I get sent down seven times. Hmm. You know, everyone has a different path. And so I think that, you know, players shouldn't compare their path with someone else's path. Uh, and I, <laughs> just, and as you read, as, you know, I know you read the book, Bill, but from the first chapter, the key is to stay on the path. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, you know, the, the hike up Camelback Mountain. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that um, – so to understand that, you know, this is not a linear projection. This is, a, this is an ebb and a flow, and that developing mental skills will help lessen the, the ups and downs because uh, you'll be able to cope with the stuff that happens a lot better. Mm-hmm. Last question for you, Bob. Um, you also emphasize the necessity of positive distractions for a pitcher. You, for example, found a release in drawing. How, how do others release the internal pressures of, of, of pitching, and why is that positive distraction so important? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, Bill, because I think that, you know, baseball – Professional baseball or any type of – at any level, it's what you do. It's not who you are. As a young player, however, it is who you are because you're trying to become, you know, your dream and your vision. So it's really hard to – there's an overlap there. But I just know that a lot of players think about the game 24-7. They get to the park too early. They keep it – they hang on to it too late. They have no balance in their life. And I think that the game is such built on failure – and and uncertainty, maybe not always failure, but certainly uncertainty, that doing something that makes you feel good helps you relax, it creates some confidence, and ultimately I think helps your performance. So, yeah, for me it was painting and artwork. For others it could be guitar. A lot of guys have taken up the guitar in the last 15 years. You know, video games are a big uh, distraction for players now. Um, but I try to encourage players to have some other, you know, more in-depth distractions, especially if they can be in the city where they can go to a children's hospital or do some stuff at the Boys and Girls Club, just to get outside of yourself a little bit and the athlete and remember, you know, there's a balance to life. I think that that balance is important as it relates to having consistent uh, performance over a length of time. I think in the end that's probably the key to success, uh, the ability to be able to separate yourself when necessary from the game because it can consume you. It can consume you. Um, and not only players but coaches. You're a coach. Right. You know, you, I think that, you know, when you love what you do, and it sounds very much like you do and you have a passion for it, sometimes it's hard to turn it off. But I think, you know, finding those – ways to recharge and feel good about something away from the, the results of the game is really important. My wife would agree with you 100%, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> We've been speaking with Bob Tewksbury, author of 90% Mental, an all-star player turned mental skills coach, reveals the hidden game of baseball, published by DeCapo Press. The book is available at your local Barnes & Noble store or online at www decapopress.com, D-A-C-A-P-O-P-R-E-S-S.com. Bob, thanks for being with us and for writing such an insightful book on the mental approach to pitching. I know that my high school pitchers have benefited from it, and I'm sure others will as well. Thanks so much, Bill. It was a wonderful uh, podcast. Uh, great to talk to a guy that uh, not only read the book, and sometimes I'm on podcasts where they don't, they kind of highlight it, but you not only read it, but you understand it, and it's really a pleasure to speak to you today about all that. So thanks for all your work and for uh, kind of spreading the, the word on on pitching through the book. Absolutely. And thank you, Philly fans, for tuning in. See you next week for another podcast of Philadelphia Baseball, Past, Present, and Personal. This is Bill Cachetis rounding third and heading home on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. The proceeding was a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. 
Thank you for listening.